So welcome to another Ozarks Voices Oral History Interview. My name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Libraries at Missouri State University. Today's date is Friday, September 29th, 2017. It's another beautiful day in the Ozarks. We're in Rockaway Beach, Missouri, uh, right on the right on Lake Tinicomo. And our guest this morning is Lewis Allen. Lewis, welcome. Thank you. So Lewis, um, you described yourself before we started the tape as a, both an engineer and an artist. Um, you work in wood, and you are very interested in the Springfield Wagon Company, correct? Yes. So tell us about uh, just overall your business and, and what all you've worked on. You showed me some things. Uh, I was really uh, pleased to learn that you did, among many other things, the giant chicken on the Branson Strip. <laughs> I, I used to tell people, I think I could build just about anything, and when I finished the chicken, I. I said, yeah, I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> when did you make that? I don't know how long uh, it was about five years ago. Uh, I got pulled in when the uh, uh, original artist engineer on the project uh, had a falling out with the, uh, the manager, the guy who was running the project. And so they needed someone who could take a, a 24 inch drawing and turn it into a 42 inch chicken. So. <laughs> Uh, that's basically, as an artist, I, I deal in detail and, and uh, like to do things proportionately and all of that. And as an engineer, I can figure out how to, how to make it stand up after, after you enlarge it. <laughs> so um, you're pleased with the finished product and the, so, the owner's been pleased? And... Yeah. It, it, he actually started out as a 38-foot uh, bird, and then they found out that someone in France had a taller chicken, and so we had to stretch him. <laughs> And uh, so. can't let the French outdo us. Well, you can't, can't <laughs> let the French chickens be bigger than our chickens. So. And it's probably withstood, I would guess, maybe at least a 75 mile, five mile an hour wind. Yeah, yeah. It, it was interesting. Uh, the morning after the tornado, I ran to uh, uh, Branson to see if the chicken had crossed the road. <laughs> and uh, 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 fortunately for us, the tornado came in over the chicken and then dropped down. <laughs> And started doing its damage. <laughs> the twister so, spared the chicken. Huh? Spared the chicken. <laughs> so, um, well, when did you become interested in Springfield Wagon Company? Well, I I was actually working for Renaissance uh, Theme Park in Blue Eye, and when they closed, uh, they were looking at doing a Western theme park in uh, Reed Springs Junction, and somebody said, "Well, if you're going to do Western, uh, you need to do wagons." And a guy from New York said, "Well, if you're going to do wagons, you need to learn how to do Springfield wagons." And that was the first I'd ever heard of a Springfield wagon. And roughly it, what year was this? Uh, this was uh, uh, around, uh, I guess it was uh, 01, 02, oh, okay. uh, no, 15 years ago, 15, 16. 16 years ago. And uh, the, the interesting thing is when you see a wooden wheel wagon uh, anywhere in this part of the country, it's referred to as a Springfield wagon. Uh, they're they're actually called uh, farm and road wagons, but uh, Springfield was the dominant wagon market. There were 800 wagon companies building wagons when Springfield was in business, but they competed on the level of uh, when wagons were selling for $55, Springfield sold for $65, and a dollar was a was a day's wages. You know, so it was it was worth more to have a Springfield wagon because of the quality and. Uh, a lot of that was quality, but a lot of it was hype. You know, they they just knew how to sell their wagons. Oh, okay. So and both so, a combination of high quality and and good good marketing. Yeah, good yeah. marketing. Yeah. Uh, why Springfield? You know, why 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 did the Springfield wagon emerge from Springfield? Well, uh, the Springfield Wagon Company started in nineteen or eighteen seventy one. Uh, the railroad had just come to Springfield and. Uh, uh, People in this area knew that they were going to have to get goods from the uh, from the farms to the railhead, and that would take wagons. And so, <clears throat> they actually started the Springfield Wagon and Plow Company. They were going to do uh, oh. uh, farm equipment and wagons. Well, the wagons you know, took off so well that even though they had uh, a half a dozen or a dozen uh, patents on farm equipment, they never got to the hmm. to the farm equipment side. Hmm. Uh, but uh, uh, Stephen Stepp's uh, master thesis uh, refers to the fact that uh, Pony Boyd and uh, 
uh, Frank Fellows uh, sort of headed up a group uh, and they got 50 Springfield business people to back the, the project and uh, they started the, the wagon company. Mm -hmm. And just before we started recording, you a little interesting bit of uh, Springfield history. So Fellows Lake, north of Springfield, which is really, my understanding, the primary water supply source for Springfield metropolitan area, yeah. is named for the Fellows family. Yes. Right. And the other thing that people don't realize is that the fairgrounds in Springfield was land donated by the Fellows family. Really? Yeah. Were the Ozark Empire Fair is? Yeah. Uh, Springfield Wagon Company was the second largest employer in Springfield at one time. They were uh, only outdone by the railroad. Really? So yeah. Frisco and then Springfield yep. uh, Wagon Company. Yep. Uh, and where was their main shop? Their main shop, they started at Boonville and Water, mm -hmm. uh, down there where the ice plant used to be. Now it's, uh, uh, it's a uh, condos or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they do, they're doing in downtown, but then they had a fire there, or no, I had a flood in uh, uh, 1897. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, at some point they had a flood, and so they moved up to where Harry Cooper's is located now, mm -hmm. and they had all that corner from there to National. In fact, uh, one of those old brick buildings on National, uh, back closer to the railroad track, belonged to the Springfield Wagon Company as yeah. storage at one time. Now do you know, so you make replicas of the Springfield Wagons, among many yeah. other things, right? And you were right. talking about how many pieces it makes just to make a 160 replica of the wagon. Right. I, I have not actually done, I, I'm because I'm an artist, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't discipline myself uh, to uh, do all the details that, that should go into these things. I had a friend uh, come in the shop here a couple of weeks ago and he's wanting to help me do the miniatures and so we sit down and I just went through all of the uh, pieces that uh, I put together to make one of these little miniature wagons mm -hmm. and we came up with 227 pieces mm -hmm. and I think I'm still missing a few that we didn't get on the list. Yeah. But, uh, uh, wagons mm -hmm. wagons were a complicated marriage of steel and wood. Mm -hmm. uh, it took. Uh, masters, uh, the guys who did the wheels are, are called wheelwrights, the guys who did the wagons themselves are called wainwrights. And uh, hmm. so I, I have actually, I, I'm not a master, uh, I'm probably uh, one of a dozen close to masters <laughs> in this part of the country, but I have learned the wheelwright art and I've learned the wainwright art. And you've made full-size wagons. I have made full-size wagons. For various... Uh, yeah, for Big Cedar, for Silver Dollar City. Uh-huh. Uh, or uh, I just uh, last week finished uh, uh, one of several chuck boxes that I've done mm -hmm. uh, for uh, some people who do the chuck wagon cooking. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, is, is demand pretty steady? I mean, you know... Uh, it's... I, I've really... I've shied away from demand, and this has been one of the... Uh, when you started this interview, you said, ask about my business. This is really not a business, it's a hobby. No, it's okay. an obsession. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's my, better, you know. My, my wife complains that it's not a business because I don't make a lot of money off of what I do. <laughs> it's, it's a not for profit. Yeah, right? it's a, I tell people I'm self unemployed and I do run a not for profit. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the passion of the history. Actually, let me back up and finish answering your question of how I got started in this. I was superintendent on the uh, Springfield uh, Business Journal project. And uh, <clears throat> when we took the, the uh, wainscot off of the stairs, there was painted on the wall, Coming Soon, Cully's New Cafe. And this sign hadn't been seen for uh, almost 100 years. Mm. That was the space... Uh, at the back of that space was the stable where uh, Wild Bill Hickok's horse was probably uh, you know, housed whenever he was having his shootout on the square. But then I did the uh, uh, Sacred Heart Catholic Church uh, remodel edition, and we, we pulled out the, the balcony, and uh, it was 14-inch uh, boards. Uh, seeing how they had put that balcony together with a mortise and tenon and a bird's mouth pocket uh, and one cut 16 penny nail on each of those boards. And I'm thinking, 
this is just master craftsmanship. I mean, these guys did this with a hammer and a, you know, a, a saw and a chisel, and, uh, but they did good work. And then when I stumbled onto the wagon company, it's like, here is a body of, you know, thousands of wagons came out of Springfield done by uh, just tremendously talented people who were dedicated to what they did. In fact, I wish I had it and I'm, I'm desperately looking for my favorite piece of uh, memorabilia that I found is a four page flyer that they did in uh, around 1915, 1916, entitled Who Builds Your Springfield Wagon? <clears throat> and it's got uh, about two dozen pictures of guys who had been working for the wagon company for several years. Mm. And when I displayed that at my wagon shows and gatherings, I had uh, one man you know, look at it and say, that's my father, you know. And uh, so it's, it's in memory of and trying to uh, preserve the work, the body of work that these guys did mm -hmm. that, you know, drives me to do what I do. The, the chicken and, uh, and the 10 foot donut and things like that, I do to survive. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, so you're like a filmmaker. You make some films to make money and some films to practice yeah. your art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so 1871, 1872? 1871. 1871 till 1952? 1942, uh, they left Springfield. They sold the trailer division to Furhoff, and they sold their wagon division to Senator William Fulbright. And he took it down to uh, Phipps Lumber in Fayetteville. And they built wagons down there for another 10 years. So they technically didn't go out of business until 1952. Okay, but they left Springfield in 42. But they left in 42. And when they left Springfield, they brought a dumpster in, parked it outside the office window, and they just pitched everything. And so... Yeah. Pains some, me. Pardon? That pains me. When you well, it, it, it's some amateur historian dove into the dumpster and pulled out three uh, file boxes full of, of stuff and if you go to the Springfield Museum that is the the uh, the Springfield wagon collection that they have is the history museum it's, on the square the history, museum, the history on the square. museum on the square has so we have to thank some amateur historian yes. who dove in, but did a dumpster dive did a dumpster dive <laughs> and he pulled out leather bound uh, you know things that looked old and historic and they were actually just sales journals, you know, yeah. talking about how the, the salesman stopped in, in uh, Aurora and then I had lunch and then went on down to the Indian Territory on the train. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, how broadly did they, did, did they sell? Uh, I have talked to gentlemen who've seen them in India and I've talked to gentlemen who've seen them in England. Really? Yeah. So they went all over the world. Uh -huh. I talked to a fellow who uh, worked for the wagon company and uh, as a young man, he said they used to grab those big 10, 11 foot long tongues and they had to walk on top of the wheels to stack them in the box cars. But they would load up box cars full of, uh, mm. of wagons. Wagons actually break down into very uh, mobile uh, pieces. Uh -huh. um, but they, they would load up wagon cars and, or uh, train cars and send full them all wagon. over the, full the country. The other thing that Springfield is, did that made them successful is they had a network of dealerships. Every hardware store you know, in the country could be a Springfield wagon dealer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, little books that I was showing you, the, the Springfield wagon catalog, mm -hmm. didn't go out to the public, it went out to the dealer. Oh. And that was the dealer's reference book. You could order your oil gear in there or if you wanted you know, a cotton box, mm -hmm. uh, you could get a uh, custom-made Springfield wagon. And what would happen is the, the trains would take these into town. They would take parts and put them up uh, on the you know, upper floors of the hardware store. Mm -hmm. And if you go into Ozark Square, mm -hmm. the hardware store on the west side of the uh, Ozark Square has one of the old elevators mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> with the big pulleys and the freight cables. Elevator, freight elevator. Yeah. Freight elevator. They would go up on the third floor, they would assemble your Springfield wagon, bring it down, and roll it out the back door. Wow. And so uh, that's, the, the dealership network uh, gave them the, you know, the profitability that uh, 
send them across the country. So at their peak, they were making thousands. Of yeah, them. over seven thousand a year. A year. And their peak. The other interesting thing before we started the recording uh, was the automobile did not kill no. the demand for wagons. No, it, it was actually the and and I I learned this through dozens of conversations with people. I have friends in Mountain Grove that uh, her family gave up the wagon in 58, uh, 1958, mm. and, or they, yeah, and got a station wagon. But the thing is, the automobiles came into the market, but they weren't farm equipment. They didn't, mm. in fact, you see pictures all over the country of where the, the horses were pulling the, the cars through the mud on, yeah. the, on the roads. And so you had this uh, inability to get to the farm and then uh, that kept the, the horses going. And then uh, you, you had the World War I, World War II came along and that took away all the gasoline and rubber. Mm -hmm. And so they went back to the wooden wheels and, and used the horses to, uh, um, you know, to do the, the pulling. And so the wagon, actually uh, uh, both wars were were big, well, the World War I was a big seller for wagons. Mm -hmm. uh, World War II wagons had, you know, had been replaced by trailers. Oh, they were actually but, selling wagons to the government? Yeah. Or to the and, and their department? Uh, Springfield competed with over 800 other wagon companies. Studebaker, uh, Owensboro, Florence, uh, a lot of your car companies uh, uh -huh. also now made wagons. started in wagons uh -huh. and then went into cars. So, um, did Springfield ever become a top five producer nationally? Or? Uh, I don't. I don't have access to any. I've got a couple friends who could answer that question, but I, I don't have access yeah. to to how they, you know, were in the. But they were respected for market. quality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the the story goes that uh, Springfield in their you know, salesmanship and, and bolstering challenged all the other wagon companies. Bring one to Springfield, uh, we'll chain them together back to back on the square and we'll get enough teams to pull in opposite directions and we'll see whose wagon is the best. Uh -huh. Well, Studebaker took them up on the challenge. Really? And so the people in Springfield gathered on the square about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, noon came when the, the challenge was supposed to take place and no Studebaker, they waited. Three or four o'clock, they finally, you know, went home. <laughs> the crowd they, grew, grew restless. They, so. they found out later that the Studebaker broke down on the way to Springfield. <laughs> so, so we won by default, <laughs> but we did win the, the challenge. Okay. Um, so, did did Springfield Wagon develop any? I guess they call design innovations. Ah, uh, yes, they did. Uh, actually, uh, prior to Springfield's uh, coming into the market, wagon tongues were stiff. And so when you went through a gully, that would pull the tongue down. And when you came out the other side, that would lift the harness up on the horse. Springfield came up with the wedged tongue, mm -hmm. which pulled against a, uh, uh, the hounds in the front and would go up and down. So mm -hmm. it, it got you in over the the uh, uh, rough roads and the Ozarks. And so go both up and down and then of course left and right. Well, so yeah, the, the, the axle itself turns, yeah. uh, but then it, it was that flexibility. Uh, I've talked to people out uh, Fairgrove, Pleasant Hope Way, and uh, they said they used to use the river bottoms, the dry river beds, uh, as part of the road coming into Springfield because it was in better shape than the roads. But uh, it's essentially a gravel road. Yeah, it was, it was a gravel road. Uh, the other thing about the wagons is, uh, if you look at the wheels, we had in the Ozarks what they called the knife wheel, which was the thin. Uh, uh -huh. I, I probably found two or three wide wheeled wagons in the Ozarks because the wider wheel, the four inch wide wheel, was made for the sand. It would it would give you a foot on top of the sand. Uh -huh. But the thin wheel... The, the knife wheel. Yeah, the, yeah, the high wheel would drop down through the mud and find a surface, you know, 18 inches down in there, 
that it could roll on yeah. and not create suction. A white wheel, when it went into that mud, it would create suction. Just trying to pull the back end right. of the wheel So out. these so wheels yeah. would drop down and find you a place to run. Really? You also, you get them to a log or a, a boulder in the road, the bigger wheel is going to roll over that easier than a smaller wheel. Uh -huh. And so you found a lot of, of uh, 24, 36 wheels wide in the west and you know Oklahoma, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, but around the Ozarks everything was narrow and, and high. Interesting. Uh, the horses could step over a log and, you know, yeah. and they could pull that big wheel over a log. Yeah. So what different kind of uses would a Springfield wagon be put to? I mean, oh, it, it's that's the beautiful thing about wagon history is a hundred years ago everybody bought something out of a wagon or put something in a wagon or everything. Whether yeah, you were it, on the farm, it, yeah, going to town. Yeah. The, now, the Springfield, the the farm and road wagon that Springfield did replaced the Conestoga. The Conestoga was the big uh, prairie schooner uh, boat. If you've been to Salt Lake City, their their uh, streets are 50 feet wide because that's what it took to turn a pair of oxen and a, and a Conestoga wagon. Uh, but the Springfield wagon could twist around there and uh, you know just maneuver. Yeah. Uh, the freight wagons were great for freighting, uh, but they uh, you know as far as usage. Now the interesting thing is a Springfield wagon, if you measure it. <coughs> is 36 inches wide and 10 feet long to the inside. Mm -hmm. And every inch of that equals a bushel. So when you took your corn or your oh. your grain to the mill, they just drive a yardstick down in there and tell you, oh. you've, got, you've got 10 bushel of... So an inch deep in a Springfield wagon was a bushel. Was a bushel, yeah. Interesting. So a, a bushel is three foot by 10 foot by one inch. One inch, interesting. Um, so they designed it that way. Yeah. Very easy to tell how much grain. Yeah. yeah. Now, the other thing is uh, <clears throat> wagons, and I tell this story, I found it on the internet. Uh, people, I had nine of the old wagons at Empire, uh, Ozark Empire Fair about uh, uh, eight or ten years ago. And this lady comes in and she looks this way and she looks this way and she says, these aren't as big as the real ones. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but these are the real ones. Oh, no, I've been to a museum. You know, I, man, uh, the story on the internet is that uh, the railroad tracks in America measure 59 and 5 eighths inches center to center, which is an odd dimension, and the question uh, begs itself, where did that come from? Well, it came from the fact that we got our rail equipment from England, and the English took their rail equipment, or took their road equipment and put it on rails, and their road equipment had to match the ruts that the Roman chariots had made in, in the roads 2,000 years ago. Anything wider would have broken into the ruts, anything yeah. narrow would have broken out. So for 2,000 years, wagons have been 59 and 5 eighths inches. And why, why did the Romans establish? Uh, that's what it took to accommodate two horses behind. Uh -huh. So that's the, the bottom line. Is, 59 and 5 eighths. Yeah. And so, are there, so what we call a standard gauge in the U.S. There, I mean, there's been narrow gauge trains. And, yeah, you know, yeah. The standard has... gauge. Now, the interesting thing in wagons, uh, around the time they started grading roads and and smoothing them out, twenties uh, or thirties, they did do a wide track wagon, and they added six inches, mm -hmm. you know, to that track. Mm -hmm. But they've never been. The other thing is when you're going west. You know, with a wagon, you want one the same size as the the one that went in front of you, because he cut the trees right. for you to get through. Right, and, and you go and if you can find a good rut that's not you know uh, the up in Nebraska on those uh, uh, I forget the river that they had to cross up there, but the there Platte? are North Platte, the Platte. Yeah, uh, uh, there are grooves in the rock where the wagons have, really? have cut. Sandstone. Yeah, in the sandstone where yeah. the wagons have cut. Interesting. Uh, let's talk about the sides for a minute. So would the sides come off? Let's say you were haying or something. Yes, and, and, uh, a, a wagon was, was totally uh, convertible. Uh -huh. uh, you had a, uh, can I grab a model or? Sure, sure. Uh, sure. You had a, a standard box That's, the reason I make these models is they're easier to show 
Uh, so that's a an accurate depiction of the yes. standard. This is a one eight scale of a Springfield wagon. Uh -huh. And uh, if you were hauling corn, you didn't need a seat. Uh -huh. uh, so the seat came off. Did some uh, drivers prefer to stand for certain jobs? Uh, yeah, or a lot of them just walked alongside the wagon. Really? Uh, you know, just, uh, it's, um, I talked to, one of the things that I want to do is start a, a down row club. Because when I talk to people 60, 70 years old, uh, they tell me, well, when we pick corn, I had to pick the down row. That was the row that the horses pushed over with the wagon. Okay. They're leaning down. The adults are picking the standing oh, corn. Kids the kids are pushing the grass, so they're getting the down the row. The kids have down. to get the down row. <laughs> a lot of, lot, of kids, lot of people told me as a kid, I got to drive the team when we picked corn. Well, what they did is they put the kids in the wagon so they were out of danger. You know, and uh, the, the the mules or the horses knew what to do. They'd get to the end of the road. And the adults would turn them around and start them back again. Anyway, wanted to show you that uh, the wagon was... Oh, oh yeah. Uh, oh. oh, so you could have a high side or a... Yeah, this, this was what a lot of people referred to as the buckboard. If you were just going to town for a few supplies, then yeah. then you and you don't want anything to slip yeah. out, but you didn't need yeah. it. Now the other versatility to it is this box. Now I've got it screwed in because I played with this one and, yeah. and towed it around. But this box just sat between the bolster stays, uh -huh. and there were cleats uh -huh. holding it in there. You would take that off, and if you notice the coupling pole or the reach has a pin in it, you could actually slide this back here another four or five feet. Oh. And with these bolster stays, you could pile this up with cordwood. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Joe Lemon uh, used to be mayor in Bolivar. He told me the story that his dad would put so much pole wood on their wagon frame that uh, the mules had to pull the front wheels back to the ground every time they took off because it would you know do this yeah <laughs> through, through the countryside <clears throat> so uh maybe this is a dumb question what were mules the primary uh force to pull a wagon mules horses oxen uh became oxen were better northern you know uh territory because they were warm-blooded and you mm -hmm. know the the mules in Missouri, just became the the dominant a animal because of their durability. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my mule trainers tell me that uh, mules have more sense than horses. But uh, yeah, uh, and so mules don't like cold weather. Uh, they they don't mind cold weather, but you no, know, they're they're you know, you you could start out in in Chicago and and make it to you know New Mexico with, with a mule. Mm -hmm. uh, the oxen, you know, you get into the warm country, they kind of... They, could, they faded, huh? Yeah, faded. Yeah. Um, so, were a lot of these innovations made by Springfield or... And uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, the, uh, there were patents uh, break. Uh, that, that's another thing. When I started studying wagons, I found out that uh, uh, they, you had Hurlbert, Gessler, you had several brake companies. Uh, very fancy ratcheted brakes, mm -hmm. and uh, then you had the flat bar with the notches in it. Uh, and uh -huh. when I would see wagons, I would think, well, the the better brake equipment is on a newer wagon, and the old ratchet system is on an older wagon. Mm -hmm. And it's the contrary, hmm. because what happened? Gessler and Hurlbert went out of business, and Springfield was continuing wagons, so they had to make their own break so they went back to a primitive or easier mm. you know manufactured because uh, they couldn't violate the patent even though yeah this, the well right they, they couldn't uh, and uh, that's the other thing whenever i rebuild wagons there are a lot of parts that i need to find that i can't make today all the flat steel i can duplicate uh but uh, the cast iron parts uh the boxings and skeins I'm I'm in the process of collecting as many of those as I can get my hands on them because uh, there were 
oh, uh, at least a dozen different size uh, wagons were measured by the inside hole in the hub mm -hmm. and and the depth of the hub. So you had a three and a half inch nine uh, was uh, a hub that had a nine inch you know, pocket in it and then mm -hmm. a three and a half inch on the inside. The, the skeins are tapered um, in order to... Uh, oh, that's the other thing about a, wa a wagon wheel is has a five degree dish in it. And it hits the ground at 90 degrees, tilts out at, at uh, 5 degrees at the top. Mm. Uh, this gives you strength. Uh, they found four or five hundred years ago that a flat wheel is going to break. It, it, there's a mathematical formula really? that you get extra strength in a cone or in the dish. And so mm. you, you walk up to a wagon and you see it sitting like this, you know it's in good shape. If you see it sitting like this, it's worn. If you see it sitting like this, it's it's worn out. Mm. Uh, you were supposed to grease your wagon every day. They they hung a bucket of grease on the on the back of the reach. Uh, you're supposed to grease it twice a day when you before you started in the morning, mm. and when you stopped at lunch before you got going again. Mm -hmm. Put grease on the bottom of those uh, skeins. Keep, keep it well lubricated. Yeah, to keep it lubricated. Um, did Springfield make any production innovation? You know, I think like Henry Ford, you know, mass production. Uh, do you know, did they do anything that was... I, I am not a, aware of any, uh, you know, uh, engineer, you know, production engineering things that are credited to, to Springfield. Mm -hmm. uh, Pretty labor intensive, it sounds like. Uh, it's, it is labor intensive. Uh, <clears throat> Like again, it's um, that that dish in the wheel. the The first wheel that I did, I put my spokes in, and then I put my tenons on uh, the ends of my spokes. When I put my uh, iron wheel on, it had a gap because I had left that at that two and a half degree angles. And what you actually have to do is put those tenons on back at a ninety degree to your to your axle mm -hmm. so that your fellows or the wood part of the wheel take the iron tire flat. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's a, a bit of a trick because you've got to start at the point where you're coming into the middle of your spoke. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a lot. It's, engin it's engineering yeah, it, and art. Yeah, it, it's engineering. You're the, right. The, the interesting thing is uh, that the wagon was the uh, pickup truck you know, of its day, and just as we Ford and Chevy and everybody, you know, try to build the best truck that they can, and they, you know, talk about the light aluminum beds or steel, you know, beds or whatever. Wagons, I have copies of engineering studies on draft, you know, uh, how easy is, is it to pull, uh, what does it take to, yeah. to start it rolling. They did all of that engineering science on wagons like they did do on cars today. So. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the old saying, all work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yeah. Um, clearly these were made for work, but were they ever used recreationally? Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm just, this is, you know, if you were a young buck and you want to take your sweetie out for a drive and, uh, you know, was there like, you know, the old backseat of the car kind of? Uh, <laughs> oh, there, there, there are, well, let me, let me tell you a few of, my wagon stories. Um, oh, Dorsey Lovell, uh, his wife uh, sent me a picture of, of her dad, and he looks like Clark Gable. He's standing up in his wagon with his pose, and uh, they tell the story on him that uh, the kids in the neighborhood, he lived you know, up on the top of the hill, and the kids at, at Halloween time would come get his wagon, and they would, you know, pull it off down, ride it down the hill, and, you know, just just have fun uh, sneaking his wagon, like turning over the outhouse. Well, yeah. one Halloween, the kids grabbed the wagon, they, they pulled it down into the into the valley, and they're all giggling, and he sets up in his wagon, <laughs> cocks his shotgun, and says, now, boys, let's see if you can get it up the hill as pull easy as you got it down. <laughs> My dad took, I don't know if it was a buggy or a wagon apart, and put it on top of the schoolhouse uh, <laughs> up in uh, in McGurk, 
Missouri. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I've got friends who use their wagons. You know, they uh, throw all the fishing tackle in there and, and go. Now, I have to offer a disclaimer here. Wagons were not recreational vehicles. You see on the movies the, the family sleeping in the wagon. Well, there are two things wrong with that. One, you've got a 36-inch box <laughs> that the family's not going to get side-by-side -side in. And two, all of your stuff is in the wagon when you travel. Right. Uh, and so... You're not going to unload the stuff. To just right, you're not going to unload the wagon to crawl in a three-foot wide uh, <laughs> space. And so what you did is just undid your canvas and pulled it out, you know, made a tent, oh. and you you slept under your wagon more than oh, more than you slept in your wagon. All right. Now, I noticed that uh, the wheels are much wider than the bed of the wagon. Now, the front makes sense because you could have some turning clearance. Right. Uh, why in the back? Just for stability? Uh, just to match the front, okay. actually. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you have in a wagon, in the back, you've got the, the axle and the bolster. In order to get the turn in the front, you have the, the uh, axle, the sandboard, and the bolster. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> the, the bolster is fastened to the front with your kingpin. Mm -hmm. And so that provides the steering. That's the reason for the smaller wheels in the front and the bigger wheels in the back is to accommodate the six inch difference in the sandboard mm -hmm. or whatever size it is mm -hmm. in order to put your wagon back flat on, on, flat, on level. Flat yeah. land would be level. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, could you ever, t so um, what were the typical points of failure for a wagon? The wheels, I imagine? Uh, yeah, wheels. Uh, again, if you, if you didn't uh, uh, lubricate it enough, uh, you you get. I've I've seen wagons with real flat bottoms on the the skeins, mm -hmm. uh, where they just were run dry. Uh, I have a picture that a, a fellow sent me from Kansas of the world's largest hay load. It's uh, forty seven thousand pounds of loose alfalfa hay. Uh, it's it's a pile about the size of this room yeah. uh, that they just uh, you know piled on apparently more than one wagon. <clears throat> uh, wagons were rated for uh, uh, four ton or eight thousand pounds, hmm. uh, so that those hickory spokes were supposed to hold that much weight. Uh, uh, in the, in the article it says the salesman was there from the wagon company saying you know stack as high as you want boys. And it did break a spoke. So, uh, <laughs> um, they tip over, or what, what kind of act, what um, kind of wagon accidents would you have? Run or horses get skittish or something? It's a, uh, you could you could roll a wagon, you know, if yeah. if it got going too fast and and took a turn. Uh, if you go to the chuck wagon races in Arkansas, you'll see them roll them down there. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, the the interesting thing is. It was easier to take wagons up a mountainside than it was to take them down a mountainside. Because they're pushing the, pushing the horses. You could get as many horses as you wanted yeah. going up, but going down, you had your brake, and then you had the breeching, which is that back strap on the mm -hmm. harness. And uh, now, two horses couldn't hold uh, you know, 8,000 pounds yeah. behind them. Yeah. Uh, they would actually, they had block and tackles. They had, they would... Uh, chain the, the wheels together uh -huh. so that all four of them would slide uh -huh. and not roll and then they would you know let them down with block and tackles on yeah. the on the steep grades but, how long would a wagon typically last if you were uh, i do not know uh longevity i you know i've i've seen wagons that they're over 120 years old mm -hmm. uh obviously they've been better kept than than the ones that uh, people put in their yards or leave out in the, in yeah. the barn. Now we're talking, you know, 71 to 42 is what, yeah. 70 years, 71 years. Yeah. Um, you know, if you looked at automobile development over a 70 year period, you highly recommend, recognize a vehicle from the front end to the back end of that time span. There right. was a, something similar here going on. And just, uh, I, mean, right. I guess what I'm getting at is like, yeah. If you had a wagon for five years, would you want to get a new model because no. you had enough innovation to... No. Uh, you could actually, if you needed new sideboards, you could order new sideboards. They, uh -huh. 
they all fit the same. Truly uh, a durable good. Yeah. Uh, if you wore out the bed, you'd, you'd, you know, you could buy a new box. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you wore a wheel out, uh, as long as you got a nine and a half by three and a half or, you know, yeah. uh, one that matched. Metal fatigue problem? Uh, actually, Springfield is accredited for uh, developing some iron. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, in the malleable steel, you know, uh, just they improved the iron that went into their wagon. and yeah, uh, the actual and, production yeah, process. And got, the... Yeah, got credit. So would they make their own iron, or would they buy? Uh, I I'm pretty sure it was uh, you know ordered in from other parts. When all said and done, there's not a lot of iron on a wagon, is there? Uh you would be surprised. Uh, you know, bolts, uh, mm-hmm. clips. Uh, the uh, there are uh, thirty six little clips mm-hmm. going down the side of the wagon. You've got bolster stay clips, top and bottom. Mm-hmm that the the side pieces uh would slide into mm-hmm. uh and then you have bow stays your straps that that made the the cover on the wagon slip down in a little staple or clip mm-hmm. and uh, the interesting thing is uh people who rebuild wagons they take all those little clips off they throw them in a coffee can and then when they put their wagon back together they just start putting them on not realizing that there are three different shapes to those clips you've got a deeper uh, more square clip that holds the uh, the box stays and then you've got a flat uh, wide clip at the top and then a flat narrow clip at the bottom for the bows that would allow your bow to slip in and then when it went into that smaller one it would jam Mm-hmm. And uh, I was at the, the chuck wagon cook-off in Lebanon uh, a couple months ago, and I saw guys that had uh, blocks or screws at the end of their clips. And I'm saying, you know, oh, you, you didn't catch the fact that that, sm- that bottom clip was supposed to be smaller. And that, that jammed your bow in uh-huh. so that it, it stayed, you know. It not only stopped from going all the way mm-hmm. to the to the ground, but it also didn't jump out, right? you know, yeah. because it was jammed into that smaller clip. But um, saying that to say on the metal and wagon, you ask, is there a lot of metal in the wagon? Uh, a wagon takes 72 feet of uh, three quarter inch beveled uh, one eighth inch metal hmm. uh, because all those clips are made out of that. And then the top of each board mm-hmm. is lined with steel. Oh, just to protect just it. to keep yeah keep it from wearing out yeah um so eight thousand pounds was the maximum weight what was the tear weight on our wagon the the uh, empty weight oh empty ah uh, I don't know I know there was a guy in Springfield that uh, bragged he could carry a wagon all the way around the square on his back <laughs> um, and and did it uh, did so, it actually yeah, did it actually did it. <laughs> So he was awful tough or they're awful light. Um, you, you had uh, white oak or hickory. Was he a chiropractor? No, yeah, well, no but he <laughs> probably gave birth to the whole chiropractic. Uh, it was a good advertiser. Maybe for yeah. a chiropractic firm. Uh, okay, what well, color? Was color. It, were they yes. all the same color? Uh, no. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, and that's when I first started my research on the wagon company, I heard that the... Uh, uh, Harry Cooper's uh, one of their buildings was the paint shop and so I ran over there as fast as I could to get a paint sample well they had steam cleaned the whole building so all of the, the, actually there was four inches of paint on the floor of the shop uh, when they probably a lead hazard I yeah and then there were chemical factors that involved but uh, no Springfields were were uh, dark green on the on the box and they were orange on the uh, on the running gear uh-huh. uh, a lot of other wagon companies were red and green uh-huh. uh, you had a few yellow and and uh, uh, oh what's the that light blue uh, uh, yeah. no. Robin's egg blue or yeah uh, colonial yeah. Uh, color anyway uh, 
but in all of the literature, they didn't have orange uh, ink. They didn't have orange ink when they printed oh. the, the, the brochures, and so you see them as green and red. And, and people you now think that Springfields were red when they were actually orange. Oh, so the actual wagon was green and orange, yeah. but they, they couldn't print the catalog. Yeah, they couldn't print the catalog with the pretty orange on it. All right, so let's talk about creature comfort. So, uh, no suspension? Uh, the only suspension you have on a wagon is the... Well, I, I, that, that's not true. Oh. Uh, you have the seat springs, which... Which make you now take the the jolt of the spring out. Yep. Uh, you could order out of the catalog. You could order bolster springs, which were a set of springs that set between the box and the bolster. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do find those a lot in the Ozarks because of our tomato canning process. You if, didn't if, want to ruin the tomatoes. If you them to if the, you yeah. didn't have bolster springs on your tomato wagon. You had juice when you got to the factory. <laughs> or you got to the factory. Yeah. So. Uh, probably the same with strawberries. Well, any any, any soft, delicate, yeah. Any kind of soft fruit yeah. or vegetable. You need a bolster spring. You needed bolster spring. But if you're just using it for hay or whatever, uh, yeah. the seat would be have a spring on it. Yeah, seat had a spring on. Now, uh, you were talking about creature comforts, and people would say, oh, how would you like to cross the country in a, in a wagon like that? You didn't. You know, the driver was in the seat, maybe a baby beside him. Yeah. But everyone else walked along yeah. the side of that wagon. And as they walked along through Nebraska and through the prairie, they had what they called a possum belly, which was a little piece of tarp suspended back here under the, under the wagon. And as you walked along beside the wagon, if it went off into a gopher hole or something like that, you grabbed those spokes like a lever and you helped it out. Oh. And then every buffalo chip and every stick that you saw, you picked up and tossed in the possum belly. Uh -huh. Because when you stopped, the wagon train stopped at night, you know, a hundred people going out looking for wood in the prairie, there was nothing to be found. <laughs> it's going to get dark before you get Yeah, that, before you got a fire going, you're... Yeah. yeah. So the possum belly was the uh, collector of anything that would burn. Mm -hmm. Well, i got to ask... Uh... Was there any padding on the seat? Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, they would put a sheep's fleece or a, or a you know something. quilted pillow or something up there. But uh, uh, those folks were a little hardier than we we are today. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> well, this has been interesting. I've I've learned I was a blank slate when I came here. I knew about Springfield Wagon. I knew it was important. So it's the second largest employer at its peak yeah. in, in the Springfield area. And uh, had a 70 or 80 year run, depending on whether you count yep. the Arkansas part of it. And it did pretty well after the advent of the automobile because yep. it was really almost like that was not a, a real strong threat um, right. until pickup trucks and other things yeah. came in. Well, what I'm trying to get across to people is that it's an icon of craftsmanship for the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. You know, I really think businesses in Springfield could profit from claiming that you know, they're hiring the descendants of the people that built the Springfield Wagon yeah, because of the quality that it stood for. Where did they get their wood? I mean, it's the uh, obvious question. Interesting. Uh, now, uh, wagons are built primarily, the spokes are all hickory, uh -huh. and they advertise second growth hickory because it was, uh, hickory is a sinewy wood. It will flex and it will come back. Yeah. Uh, Oak, uh, pretty brittle. It it breaks, yeah. uh, and so uh, you wanted you wanted the spring in your wheels. You wanted white oak, not red oak, mm -hmm. uh, in your running gear and in your hounds. Uh, the the boards in the front. Uh, these are hounds, the wagon hounds, mm -hmm. and again, you wanted those out of e either a, a sinewy hickory. Or a, uh, uh, also white oak is an interlocked grain, so it will rip before it breaks. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, because of that, uh, we live in the Ozarks. I'll show you here in a minute. I've got a, a collection of uh, 20, 
two of the 50 different kinds of wood that grow in the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, there's the, the story is told that uh, uh, the fellows, uh, and the, the guys at the wagon company and Mr. Fellows, uh, when they built the railroad track down towards Chadwick, mm -hmm. they said, oh, let's build a railroad you know, all the way to, to uh, Florida. And they got to Chadwick, and well, we got lumber now, so we're good. <laughs> no. uh, so we we do have the Ozarks is is plentiful of white oak and hickory. Yeah, so a lot of local wood. Would yeah, use uh, yeah, it was wood. it was pri primarily local wood. Yeah, uh, railroad ties was a big business. Yeah, it was for about it wasn't very long, about twenty years. Yeah, again, they <clears> would <throat> they would pull the the. Uh, box off of a wagon and then just buck those railroad ties stack them up on the on the wagon on and then the just wagon. to get it to the rail yeah head. to get them to the rail head yeah all right so a lot of probably a lot of wagons and yeah. down there and around chadwick pulling yeah. pull ties up to the rail head yeah are you familiar with cliquo missouri uh, i know of it uh up sure. north of, of bolivar i'm not sure i've ever been there uh it, it's an interesting uh it has you no know, uh, a double interest in the in the wagon you know, story because uh, they started as the place w when the trail drives the cattle drives came into Sedalia uh, they would put the the uh, drovers and their horses on a train and ship them down to Cleco before they paid them mm. so that when they got drunk and shot the place up it was Cleco not Sedalia uh, but then Cliquo towards their end became a railhead uh, for the railroad ties. Uh -huh. So okay. Well, thanks very much. It's been My very pleasure. interesting, and uh, we've been speaking with Lewis Allen about the Springfield Wagon Company. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.